Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word. Today our journey takes us to Deuteronomy chapters 20 through 22. Verse 5 of chapter 22, A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, I figured that would get everyone's attention to start off with, and we're going to talk about that more later. But today, military marriage and murder. Kind of sounds like an Alfred Hitchcock thriller, but it's not. What we have here, we find more guidance for a new nation as the Lord gives them direction on establishing their military, how they deal with unsolved murder cases, guidance for marriage, and a grab bag of other miscellaneous items. Now, in just a few days, we're going to wrap up the book of Deuteronomy, and then we will, have been, we will finish with the Pentateuch, that is, the books of the law. Now, combine that with Job, and we will have completed six books on our two-year journey through the Bible. Now, you're not going to want to miss where we're going next, because we're moving into a new phase. We're going to be looking at the historical books of the Bible as we look at Joshua, one of my favorite books. But Moses is turning leadership over to Joshua. And so this moves us into a, a new uh, element of the Bible as we begin to look at, as I said, at the historical book. So be thinking over the next couple of days who you might invite to join us on this journey through the Bible. And if you would like to share uh, contact information with them, just give them the word Bible to text to 67742. That is 67742, the word Bible, and they'll get a link to all the resources available on this journey through the Bible. Now, remember, the study of the Old Testament, as we're doing this, we're looking primarily for spiritual principles and truths that would apply to us as believers in Jesus Christ today. Now, what God was doing through Moses in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy was first restoring an understanding of the moral law of God or the natural law that is written on the hearts of human beings at creation. Paul talks about this over in, in Romans. But it was dulled by the effects of sin. And what the Ten Commandments were about was restoring an understanding of the moral law of God. Now, that moral law of God continues. Of course, we, we can't keep it any better than they did, and therefore we are not saved from our sin by keeping the Ten Commandments, but rather we're made aware of our inadequacy to live up to God's standard, which is why we need a Savior, that Savior being Jesus Christ. So following the Ten Commandments, the moral law, Moses then gives the ceremonial law for worship and the civil laws for a theocratic nation. And a theocratic nation is a nation of which God was the head. Now, in these uh, latter two categories, again, we look for guiding principles. We can't take laws directly that were crafted for a theocracy 3,400 3, years ago and apply them to, to our nation. But, but there are principles here that we can learn from, and in fact, our founders did, and they applied them to our nation. We've already seen that in our study, and we're going to see that even more. Think about it this way. If God gave direction, you know it's good, okay? So we would benefit from this transcendent wisdom and truth found in the guidance that God gave to the nation of Israel. All right, let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 20. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. And do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. It's not the size of the army in the battle that our eyes should be fixed upon, but rather the size of the God who leads us. That's where success comes from. The priests were there to deliver a message to the, to the warriors. Don't fear. Keep your eyes on God. Now, fear is real. Warfare and death are real. But guess what? So is God. God is real. And he goes with us and he fights for us if we are walking in fellowship with him. 
Now, the presence of the priest pointing to God was a reminder of their transcendent cause. It, things were, what they were involved in was much bigger than themselves. This, that's what a transcendent cause is. It, it, it means we have a purpose beyond ourselves. And you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, if we made him the Lord and Savior of our lives, then, then we have a transcendent cause. We have a purpose that goes beyond our own being and our own existence. And that's what gives life meaning. That's why so many people are searching for meaning to life because they do not have a relationship with their creator, which then gives them an, un, an, opening, uh, an opening of their eyes and an understanding as to why they are here and what their purpose is. And that purpose is transcendent. All right, George Washington the commander of the Continental Army, understood this. That's why he asked for funds to be uh, established for chaplains in the military. In July of 1775, Congress approved that request, and the Chaplain Corps was created, which has been in our military ever since. Of course, just as we read in these passages, as we've been reading and as we will read, Diligence is required to preserve what is established and to keep it from drifting into apostasy. And unfortunately, that is what has and is happening in our nation's military, even in the chaplain's corps. All right, in verses 5 through 9, we read of various exemptions from military service that was granted. Number one was a new house. Number two, a new vineyard, meaning a new livelihood, a new business. Number three, a new wife. And four, fear, if they were fearful. Now, I think this is important because it has a bearing on us today, and here's why. The reasons for the exemptions were, they really spoke to the purpose of the military, right? The military's purpose was to fight and win the nation's battles. So these individuals in these four categories were exempted because they would be distracted and become a distraction and a hindrance to others. I personally think this supports the idea of a voluntary military, which we've had since the draft was abandoned after the Vietnam War. This has worked well until probably the last 10 to 15 years uh, when the um, military became infused with the left's social policies. You know, it really goes back to the to the 90s when homosexuality was introduced, you know, don't ask, don't tell. Of course, Barack Obama, President Obama removed that for open homosexuality and then uh, introduced transgenderism into the military only for that to be stopped by the Trump administration only to be restarted by the Biden administration. So these, these socialist policies, the, these radical social ideas are a distraction from our military's purpose. What does that have to do with fighting and winning wars? It has nothing to do with that. But the elevation of sexual idolatry in our military uh, as a way to influence and affirm the broader culture has made our military nothing more than a, a laboratory of social experimentation and, has, and the military as a result has become increasingly ineffective. And guess what, our enemies, do not fear us, and we see that our weakness is uh, becoming more prominent on the world stage, which makes us vulnerable. It makes us dangerous, as we, we've looked at before. Peace comes through strength. Strength comes fr from walking in obedience to God. Uh, we are not walking in obedience to God, not in our military, not in the broader culture, and as a result, weakness is uh, pervasive. Another aspect of the military that this speaks to is the warf that warfare is not to be our focus. Right? As we see in verses 10 through 15, guidance in foreign policy was to pursue peace. Warfare was not to be the way of life for this nation, but rather a means of protecting and preserving life. They were not to be a warrior nation, nor are we. In verses 19 and 20, practical guidance for besieging a city that considers how warfare impacts the environment and the production of food. So take note of that. All right, let's move to chapter 21, verse 1. If anyone is found slain lying in the field in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess, and it is not known who killed him, then the elders and your judges shall go out and measure the distance from the slain man to the surrounding cities. So, who done it? I mean, it's a murder mystery. 
the city nearest the murder victim was to take responsibility for not just investigating the crime, but in dealing with, and this is important, in dealing with the stain of innocent blood on the land. Uh, this is a lost concept on us. Look at verse 9. So you shall put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Now they were to offer a heifer and offer it as a sacrifice to make redemption for the innocent blood that had been shed. Now considering the, the time and the resources involved here, they would want to ensure that things like this didn't happen, that, there, that murder wasn't rampant. I mean, think, think if this were required today in America. I mean, we'd run out of cows, given the number of homicides and murders that we see in America today. But don't miss the underlying principle here, because we have devalued human life, and we have allowed innocent blood to be shed in this land. And guess what happens? You get more of it. It, become, it just begins to multiply, because life is devalued and becomes a downward spiral. And we see that happening in our culture today. In the rest of chapter 21 and 22, several issues are addressed. And again, we're looking for principles that may apply to the policies that we adopt. For example, look at uh, chapter 22, verse 1. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and hide yourself from them. You shall certainly bring them back to your brother. I mean, this is not talking about hide and go seek with the animals on the barnyard. Um, I know you say, well, what application to this? I mean, how often do you see a, an ox or a, a sheep that's walking around in your yard? Well, some of us may. I still see uh, animals that get out in, in, in where we live in Louisiana, kind of in the rural area. But that's not the point. The point is we are not to look the other way and not get involved when it affects others, our community, our neighbors, our family. We, we, we cannot just turn a blind eye. We need to be involved, and we need to be concerned about the well-being of others. Verse 5 of chapter 22, A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Okay, you want to know what I have to say about this? All right, drag shows are not an innocent form of entertainment. They are an act of abomination. It's an abominable act. It says that's right here. And it's not fun and games. It is about desensitizing the moral construct and in, in, in understanding of our culture. And it's simply leading the way to broader immorality. And in, in fact, some have said this is about grooming, and I think it is. It is desensitizing our children, and it is grooming them. And and if, if we're not to turn a blind eye to someone's sheep, someone's, uh, you know, uh, ox or oxen that have gotten out, well, should we be turning a blind eye to an agenda that is going after their children? I don't think so. Verse 6 of chapter 22, If a bird's nest happens to be before you along the way, in any tree or on the ground, with young ones or eggs, with the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. As we saw just a moment ago in chapter 20 about cutting down trees when a city is besieged, the Bible speaks to environmentalism with a purpose. All right? we, we, are to, we, we are not to worship creation, but we are to care for it. We have a responsibility to do that. We've been given this land, and we should take care of it. We've been given the earth as a place for us to dwell in. Chapter 22, verse 8, When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not build, uh, that you might not bring guilt of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. So if you, where they would have the roofs up there, you know, put a railing around it so that they don't fall off, and you bring bloodshed and guilt of this bloodshed. Notice again, you know, there is a, a, a focus that we've seen throughout these last couple of books about the shedding of blood and how serious God takes that. So what do we gain from this particular passage here of regarding 
uh, putting uh, railings around your roof. You know what? I, uh, biblical building codes, if you will. We are to take steps to prevent others from being injured. Thinking ahead of possible vulnerabilities in our structures and in, in, in our conduct. Here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line in this, and this is where we our founders understood this. There's a quote that I, I use often from John Adams, who said that our Constitution is made for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. The reason for that is. This, by following scripture in these underlying principles, that's self-government. We're governing ourselves, doing things that we know benefit and prevent harm from others. That's self-government. And then we teach it in our family. We, we reinforce that in teaching our children. That's family government. And when we do that, we don't need expansive civil government that tells us what to do for everything, which is essentially what we have now. And government will fill that, civil government will fill the vacuum, the void left by a lack of self-government and a lack of family government. In fact, some are eager to expand the reach of civil government. So the Bible is very practical, you know, in, in terms of how we live our lives. And, you know, for most of our country's history, as a nation, we followed these biblical principles, both individually in families and in the broader community in our civil government. Because these, these principles are rooted in the moral or the natural, the moral law of God or the natural law. But in the last 50 to 60 years, we have departed from these truths and the consequences of that are quite evident. We need to return to the truth. And you may say, well, that's a daunting task. How can I do that? with yourself, number one. If we begin to govern ourselves according to the principles of Scripture and then instilling them in our children, our grandchildren, living them out in our homes, and then as the opportunity has or is given to us, we can do that in the broader community. But each of us can start right where God has placed us to exercise the authority that He's given us, and we all have authority over ourselves. That's what God has given us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, such rich, rich truths that if we would just yield to your word, Lord, how much better it would be for us individually and collectively as a society. So I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would continue to guide us through this journey, pointing out these things in your word, these, these truths, these principles that we need to and you would desire for us to apply to our lives. And so we thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hope you have a great day. And until next time, keep standing on the Word. Today's study comes from the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan, available for free at frc.org slash Bible. By following along in just a few minutes a day, you can read through the entire Bible in just two years. Learn more and request the free reading guide at frc.org slash Bible.